I'm Dr. Laura Gifford. The results that we have gotten in this place clinically have been astounding. We need to eat food that's real. Ditch the sugars and the grain. Fat doesn't make you fat. Fat does not cause heart disease. You literally are what you eat. Let's talk about insulin and where it comes from and what happens um, in, in the body. I'm Dr. Jillian Murphy. This is definitely not what I was taught in school. This is what I thought that food should be able to do for people. There's that old adage, you are what you eat, but you really actually are what you digest. The ultimate health combination is vegetables plus protein plus healthy fat. Cholesterol gets such a bad rap. All of our sex hormones come from cholesterol. Healthy poop versus not so healthy poop. Any questions about that? I'm Michelle McKelpin. 80% of our body composition is based on what you eat. Move frequently at a slow pace. Lift heavy things. Resistance training. It's not too late. You can put muscle mass on at any age. You really don't need weights or machines. Posture is really, really important. If it comes from a factory and has and has an ingredients list, it's not, it's not whole food, it's not the way nature intended it. And you'd be amazed, we, we are abundant the amount of food we actually have that comes from the earth or roams the earth. That's really what we're designed to eat. So tonight's lecture is, it's, um, it's going to be talking more about the why behind the whole paleo diet and the grain free and, and that sort of stuff. And really the main thing we're going to talk about is, is insulin. Does anyone here have an understanding of insulin, what it does? Everybody's heard of insulin, right? Mm -hmm. And um, is it, anybody want to shoot off uh, uh, something about what it does? Only oh, thing I know is when are you a nurse? When, no, when yeah. your sugar goes up, your body needs more insulin, so it tries to produce more insulin. To right. Yeah. Exactly. Sugar. Yeah. It's, it's it's sort of the sugar moderator Just in our hot flash. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how about that? Fuck you. Um, you. <laughs> it's the sugar moderator in our in our in our diet, and it really really. Um, poses a problem for us over the long term when we're when we're jacking it up all the time. So let's talk about it. So first of all I wanna I wanna point something out. 80% of your ability to reduce excess body fat, 80%, that's a big number. 80% of your ability to reduce excess body fat is determined by how you eat, with the other 20% depending on proper exercise or healthy healthy lifestyle habits and genetics. So when people try and exercise, and this is not a weight loss program, but a lot of people are concerned about weight loss. I find weight loss as like a nice side effect of people getting healthier, but we do talk about weight loss because it's something that people are really concerned about. So I'll have people say, oh, I'm exercising more. You know, why am I not losing weight? Has anyone watched a marathon ever, half marathon? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of fairly large people who, who you know, are running, those, running the, the middle of sort of the pack. Um, some of them you'll see that they're fairly large people and they're training, they're running hours and hours and hours a week to train for a marathon, yet they're still they're still holding on to a lot of a lot of body fat. Twenty only twenty percent of your body composition is due to exercise, genetics, and lifestyle habits. It's not really so, you know, if your mom's really overweight and you say, Oh well, you know, I'm overweight because my mom is or or the, you know, my dad or anything like that it's not really playing that big of a factor, a very minimal factor. So 80% of how you look, feel, and perform is actually due to what you put in your body. Pretty, pretty interesting statistic. Where is that from? Uh, uh, Mark Sisson, I think, was one of the people that said that. Um, and you can Google it, you can check it out. <clears throat> your ability to reduce excess body fat and maintain Desirable body composition is directly reflective of your ability to moderate insulin production with healthy diet habits and to a lesser extent your willingness to follow a sensible exercise program that combines extensive low-level cardio, frequent short intense strength training sessions, and occasional all-out sprints. This basically in this one sentence summarizes the entire sort of paleo lifestyle, paleo primal kind of lifestyle. So what we want to do is we want to moderate our insulin with what the, the food that we're putting in our body. It's so vitally important to our overall health, how we feel, how we perform, how we hold on to fat, with, uh, um, to a lesser extent affecting it with exercise. And next week's lecture is all on the why behind how we're, we're not exercising um, properly. You, I know everyone knows someone who goes to the gym three, four, five, six days a week, exercises for about an hour or two, and just like on the treadmill, going, 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 and you know, they look the same, they never change, they're always exhausted. After their exercise class, they have to eat because they're just so drained. Um, or they're going and they're just, they're just you know, <coughs> spending 
hours in the gym trying to get stronger um, and and they're not actually really doing their body that much much benefit so next week's lecture is all on the fitness aspect of it this week's all on the first little part of that paragraph so let's talk about insulin and where it comes from and what happens um, in in the body so we have a meal that's got so, so does everybody understand that everything we put in our body gets broken down into three three components Glucose, fat, or protein. That's it. So when people say, oh, I get so bored on the paleo diet or the primal diet. Oh my gosh, there's nothing to eat. I eat this, it feels like we're eating the same thing all the time. People eat the same thing all the time, all the time. They have pizza, pasta, lasagna, um, what else? And if you take, so let's take pizza, pizza pasta, oh, lasagna. Pardon? Sandwich. Yeah, sandwich would even be in there, even a, like a bacon and tomato sandwich or something like that. You break all of those down chemically, they're all the same thing. They all, like, when you look at the ingredients in all those things, like people think that, oh, we're going to have lasagna tonight, we're going to have spaghetti tomorrow night, we're going to have pizza the next night. It's all, like, it all breaks down to the exact same, same chemical components. So when you start thinking about food and breaking it down into what it turns into in your body, you can start looking at food a little differently. So... What we're going to be looking at are the things that turn into glucose, basically, which are, um, who, does anybody know what turns into glucose? Anybody? Yes, Ben? Carbohydrates. Yeah, most of, and most of the carbohydrates that you, that you eat are going to turn into, into glucose. Um, some of your vegetables, um, some of your vegetables, uh, all of your grains, and uh, beans, lentils, that's a little different. They are, they are carbs as well. They have protein in them as well. So, and, and most foods have a little bit of everything in them. Vegetables don't have any fat in them. Um, not a lot of protein in them. Uh, lentils have protein, a little bit of carb, you know, this sort of thing. So most food, foods have a sort of a breakdown of different ratios. But what we're trying to do is talk about the foods that really, really spike our insulin. So we have a meal. It gets digested, actually starts to get digested in our mouth starts to digest in our, in, our, um, in our small intestine, stomach small intestine, and it breaks down into the glucose molecule. There's a glucose molecule there. And then our pancreas gets signaled. So that's a, that's a nice little organ to our pancreas. Our panca pancreas gets signaled that there's a rise in our blood glucose level. <clears throat> we do not, in any circumstance, want glucose um, running around in our blood system at all. Dr. Oz, which I don't watch a lot, I don't know why I was watching it that one time, or maybe I saw it in a video, gave a really, really good analogy. It's not really physiologically correct, but it's a nice visual to have. When you have glucose floating around, sugar molecules basically floating around in your blood system, you can almost picture it, picture white table sugar, right? Just like scraping the insides of your arteries and stuff like that. Like that's the damage that free glucose does in our body. It causes tons of inflammation and tons of arterial damage. So the body does not want glucose floating around in our blood system. So the pancreas pumps up insulin and insulin just gobbles up the, the uh, glucose basically and shoves it into three different places in our body. One of them is in our muscles, which is great. We really need to have, and it's stored as glycogen, we need to have muscle glycogen. We need to have, that's our energy source that we need. If we need to go run for a bus, or we need to do, do, do some work, we need to do any kind of exercise, we store it in our muscles. We also store it in our liver. Our liver has glycogen in it as well. Those are great storage spots, but they're limited. There's only a certain amount of glycogen that you can, that you can store there. Once those are full, the next place we store it is, anyone else know? Where we store excess excess glucose? Any have any any idea? Anybody know what that fat is? Cells. Fat cells. Exactly. It goes right into our fat cells, and they have an unlimited storage capacity for insulin. They can just store and store and store. You can just keep shoving it in because they can just grow and grow and grow. So, um, what I want to talk about tonight is um, the fact that we need to start using these, this is the exercise component, we need to start depleting these sources so that any carbohydrate that we eat gets, goes into here and doesn't get used into the, doesn't go into the, into the, fat, into the fat cells. So let's talk a little bit about um, another thing that sort of happens to us when we talk about the energy system in our, in our body. So eat a high glycemic food. So when I say high glycemic food, I mean a food that's going to really spike your insulin response. So you eat a high glycemic, which is mostly everything that we eat, such as cornflakes, bagel, um, any kind of bread, any kind of cookie, oh yeah, cookie, pretzels, um, what, what, 
What do we eat for breakfast? Bagels, cornflakes, toasts, any kind of cereal, rice, um, hot, huge high glycemic, couscous, pasta, um, all those things have a really high glycemic, high, high glycemic index and they really, really spike our insulin. Mm -hmm. So our blood glucose rises, insulin's released from the pancreas, and then our blood glu glucose drops a little bit, okay? And then we can feel that drop, right? Everyone feels that. You, you get up in the morning, you have your high glucose breakfast, and literally about half an hour later, maybe within a couple of hours at least, you're kind of getting that energy low again. And it's an energy low as well as it is a little bit of hunger because you're, you're, you know, your, your glucose levels are starting, to, are starting to drop and you've actually got too much insulin in your system. For whatever reason, the body tends to overreact a little bit. So your body's bathed in this, in this insulin and you're hungry and you're lethargic and tired. In enters chronic cardio. So this is one thing where you just go on that. Can you everyone see that sort of treadmill that you end up all a day? You eat up, you eat something high glycemic. Boom, you go, you jump up and then you jump. Everybody feels that you're going up and down. You're like all day long. Boom, 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 boom. Like you're just up and down, up and down. Then comes in your time to exercise. So you go and you're doing your exercise. You run for like an hour, you know, sort of thing. And then after you finish your run, a lot of people are starving and they're kind of like a little bit shaky and they're a little. So they've got to eat. They got to have and it's got to be sugar. They, Bananas, sport drinks, um, a bagel again, all those bars, all that sort of stuff so, they, so that they feel better. They, their body is depleted. They need this glucose. They're, they're draining it from their, from their system. So your body's craving this because it actually can't access the glucose from the fat cells or anything else. So your glucose drops again and then you have to eat, you know, you're eating. So then you end up on this, on this whole train again. And what happens with this chronic exercise, and you'll see it, is that you... You exercise and then you have to eat and then you feel guilty so you exercise more and then you have to eat and you exercise you know this whole sort of train that you get on and exercise is actually forcing you to eat those these high carbohydrate carbohydrate foods you need to eat those foods in order to sustain the amount of exercise you're doing at these higher longer sort of um, mid-range high intensities which we're going to get into which we're going to get into next week so let's talk a little bit more about insulin so when we're doing this all day long, every time we put food in our mouth, we're spiking our insulin, we're spiking our insulin, and the glucose is just going up and down, up and down all day long, we're adding exercise, and it causes insulin to, or glucose to go up and down. Our insulin levels start to, sort of, start to sort of jack up a little bit. And what insulin does is it not only encourages um, the body to store unused glucose as fat, but what it also does is it has a fat sparing effect. When there's lots of insulin in our body, you cannot access your fat cells for energy. And fat's got tons of energy, tons of energy, way more than a carbohydrate, almost double what carbohydrate will offer you. So if you can learn to burn your fat cells for energy versus, your, versus carbohydrate that you're eating for energy or the limited amount of carbohydrate in your muscle and your liver glycogen, if you can access that, you have way, way more energy. But what insulin does, if you have insulin floating around in your system, you can't access your fat cells. You cannot access your fat cells. So for example, you know, I go and I eat my Gatorade or my protein snack that jacks up my insulin, and then I go exercise, I can only burn carbohydrates as energy. I cannot burn fat, no matter what type of exercise I do. Does that make sense? This is really, really important point. You can have carbs before you exercise, but you certainly do not want to jack up your carbohydrate intake before exercise because you won't have the ability to access your fat cells. Well, why it, do white runners do Pardon? Why do runners do it? They do it all the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. And runners, and, and a lot of runners do it, and I was saying, like a lot of runners, one, there's, there's runners out there who are not necessarily lean and, and um, you know, using that. Some runners have such good glycogen stores in their muscles, they've trained that so that they, they can access those carbs, right? They're, they're using those. And um, so they've trained their muscles to have a huge glycogen store. So they're using those carbohydrates in that, in that system. So they don't need their fat cells to keep, to keep going. And all those um, triathletes, runners, long distance runners, they, they're, they have to use carbs. Like they bonk, right? They, they, their sugar levels drop. They, they have to keep feeding themselves. Humans are actually to be able to design to just be able to go forever um, with, with nothing because they can just use up their fat cells if they have fat that's, that's available. So insulin also, this is Dr. Robert Lustig. He's got a fantastic video out there called um, 
what's it called? It, 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 basically, if you put Dr. Robert Lustig and you and you just put sugar in in the um, in the tag there, it's an amazing video. It's got about a two hour YouTube video on the effects of sugar, especially high fructose corn syrup and whatnot. He's a pediatric oncologist, and it, and he also talks about insulin stimulating your appetite. So people who are constantly eating these foods that are glycemic, the high glycemic index, are constantly hungry. It, it, your, your blood sugar is unstable, so you, it makes you hungry. Insulin <coughs> makes you extremely, extremely hungry. So his research is amazing. So he looks after, um, he's a pediatric endocrinologist, so he's looking after these like terribly, terribly obese children. And the solution for childhood obesity right now is more exercise, less food, more exercise. And he said, no, 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 no. These kids, like, aren't lazy. They're not lazy and, and, and they're not gluttons, right? They're just simply eating the wrong food that's affecting their hormones. It's not the child, or it's not even the adult. It's not us, it's not your fault that you feel like crap all the time you don't want to exercise, and you can't burn fat. It's because of the effect of insulin. It's the hormonal effect of the food that makes you feel sleepy and tired and groggy, and it makes you hungry. You want to eat. You want to lie on the couch. The reason behind this is that basically the human, the human body is so smart, right? In times of um, lots of food availability back in the day, E, 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 e. You, humans used to want to store fat, right? They'd want to have, they, they want to store as much as they can. So what a genius idea, being able to store these extra calories for the winter when food was going to be scarce. And then when winter comes along, you move back to your fat metabolism and you can use it. There's a reason behind this. But now we're just, we, it's just constant, eating it constantly, constantly, constantly. And sadly, in, and then when you're eating all that food, you don't want to be burning your fat. So the so insulin is there to, as a protective mechanism, so you're not wasting those, you're trying to store, you're not trying to use. Um, and the, the human body basically knows, it, it's, it's so smart, but we've just been overriding it for so long. So we're in, like, basically, when we're overeating, we think we're going to be heading into a, a phase of starvation, basically. And the body's preparing for that, and we just have to stop it. So he thinks that the problem with obesity on all these children and everybody is that the amount of insulin that's surging through our system is making us feel like crap all the time. Groggy, unfocused, um, and hungry. So if you just changed what is going into the body, you'd have more energy, and you would actually feel like exercising, and you wouldn't be as hungry It's once you stabilize that. So what starts to happen over time, liver and muscle cells, right, because if we're eating insulin, if we're eating sugar all the time, insulin's just, you know, it's just cranking. So we've got the liver and muscle cells constantly being bombarded. Like liver basically knocks on their cells and says, let the glucose in, let the glucose in. Finally, liver and muscle are like, get out, get out, stop. You know, it's like, you know when there's a loud noise in the room and it's, and then eventually you just sort of adapt to it and you don't hear it anymore. That's what happens to the liver, liver and the muscle cells. They become insensitive to the insulin. So in order to get insulin into the liver and the muscle cells, you start having to produce more and more and more to get as the same amount of glucose in because the liver and the muscle, it's always there. So why am I going to respond if you're always there driving me crazy? I'm only going to respond if you really make me pay attention. So over time, you're, you, it, it gets almost impossible to get... Uh, glucose, glycogen stores into your into your muscles. It gets harder and harder. So over time, liver and muscle cells become insensitive to insulin. Fat cells can't release their stored energy into the bloodstream, right? Because you can't use fat as energy source when you have insulin in your system. The fat cells get bigger. Then what starts to happen is the blood glucose starts to sort of stay high, and the pancreas just starts to burn itself out, right? The poor old pancreas is tr trying to put out a bunch of insulin. No one's listening to them. There's nowhere to store it. The fat cells are going crazy. The pancreas is overworking. Every time, every 30 minutes, there's some kind of sugar assault going in. Insulin, insulin, this poor thing is just chugging away. And then we get type 2 diabetes, right? So it never used to exist. It was adult onset diabetes because it used to take, we'd have, we had more whole food, less sugar, less sugar in all of our foods. Um, so it took 40 or 50 years now for the pancreas to burn itself out.
Now it's taking, you know, 10, 15 years, even less, for the pancreas to burn itself out because it's just the assault that it's on. The pancreas wasn't meant to work all the time. Insulin, so insulin makes you tired, it makes you feel awful, it makes you hungry, and it won't let you burn your fat as a fuel source. Even if the treadmill says that you're in fat burning mode, if you're bathed in insulin, you don't have access to your, to your fat cells. Insulin also has a negative effect on growth hormone, thyroid hormone, sex hormones, adrenal function, and that's just a few of the hormones. Insulin affects everything. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's really, 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 um, it's an important hormone. We couldn't function without it, right? That's type 2, type 1 diabetes, right? There's people who have, we have to have insulin, but we've, we're abusing it and it's getting out of control and it's really throwing off all of the, all of the hormones. So if we can get the insulin out of control, under control, um, Dr. Murphy talks about the fact that if you line up the insulin and start, start managing that, some of the other hormones start to function a little bit better as well. I want to talk a little bit about, does anybody have any questions about insulin right now? Does everybody understand the effects of it? That, and then I, maybe we should just go through right now like some of the some of the foods. Like for example, a steak will have some carbohydrate in it, it has some fat and it has some protein, but it is not going to spike your insulin response um, at all. Um, there are carbohydrates in, in vegetables, but they don't tend to have a huge response to your insulin. But there are carbohydrates. So the paleo diet isn't a low 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 carb diet. It's a low insulin producing diet and it, what it does and what this paleo diet and the whole lifestyle is, is that we want to get the, you, your body fat adapted. So check that out on Google that about fat, ad, fat adapted versus carb adapted or sugar adapted. We want to teach your body how to use fat as a fuel versus carbohydrates as a fuel. And that's <coughs> super important because at that stage, your hunger goes down. Um, your energy stays stable all day because you don't have this, this up and down. You're not using your sugars. You don't need carbohydrates to, to function, although there is always a low level of carbohydrates in this diet because a carrot, um, a, you know, a sweet potato, um, cauliflower, broccoli, they all have carbohydrates in them. What about um, fruit? Do you have a vegetable? Fruit, yeah. Fruit has tons of carbs and tons of sugar, and it's fructose and stuff like that. So, and fruit is something that you eat on the paleo diet, whereas Atkins, you wouldn't touch fruit. Now, if someone's trying to lose a lot of weight or trying to get really fat adapted, fruit is not something that you want to eat a ton of. That being said, depending on your activity level and how balanced your sugars are, you don't want to take fruit out. It is so nutrient dense, especially berries. Berries are the, one of the best fruit to eat because it's got a lower glycemic index sort of thing. Um, so fruit isn't something, and it's from nature. It's a whole food. It's good for you. It's great. We don't want to take fruit out of our, you know, out of out of the whole thing. But if you're trying to lose weight and you want to stabilize your energy through the day, if you have a lot of fruit for breakfast, that can throw you off. I find if I have fruit for breakfast, other than berries, it kind of I can feel it um, more during the day versus if I have you know steak and eggs for breakfast. Um, I can I can sustain my energy much more with a higher protein higher protein breakfast towards the end of the day. And also, too, if I'm exercising a ton and doing a really, really heavy workout, I'll have some fruit afterwards or I'll have some carbs afterwards to replenish those muscle glycogen and liver glycogen stores that I've depleted through my, through my exercise, but not so much before. I don't want to eat. I don't barely eat before a workout usually because I'm not that hungry because I'm, I'm quite fat adapted now, but it's been three years that, uh, that, I've, been, that I've been doing this. Um, any other questions about insulin? We'll, we'll come back to it in a sec, but... I want to talk, Dr. Murphy's going to do a whole lecture just on fat, and it's a fantastic lecture because many people in this room have been, have, we've grown up with this whole fat hypothesis, right? That eating fat drives cholesterol, which drives heart disease. It is wrong. We've been, we've been totally sold a bill of goods. The, the, all the research out there is, is pointing to the fact that fat does not cause heart disease. And um, many studies are now showing that it, the opposite is actually true. And really what they feel is behind heart disease and atherosclerosis is inflammation, which is one of the major drivers behind inflammation is insulin. So you asked your question about runners. It is not uncommon for these healthy runners 
to have a lot of cardiovascular issues. It's not uncommon. Like everyone's already heard of that. The, you know, the runner who sort of who sort of drops dead, sort of thing. Yeah. It's it's not uncommon at all to have a lot of cardiovascular damage from a, a excessive inflammation because they they're just constantly sugar, 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 sugar. They live off of sugar and they run, 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 run. Um, so some people genetically, there's also the genetic and individual individual basis on some of those things, but. Research is really out there that does not support this whole fat thing. We need saturated fat. We need fat in order to, for our brain to function, for our body to function. Why is it so important in the first year of a baby's life that we have whole fats and they get tons of fat and then all of a sudden it's not important anymore? Um, children are, are told, how old is it that they're told to have, drink whole milk and high fat everything? Is it just the first year or has it gone beyond that or is it the first five years? I think you said the first, like, year first yeah, that you want whole milk, right? Like you don't give a two-year-old kid skim milk, though, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're told whole milk. I don't know how long it's supposed to go, but suddenly there's a change, and then we're an adult. You know, you're you're drinking skim milk and and all this sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> check it out for yourself. But Dr. Murphy is going to do a fantastic one whole night just on fat and why we need it and why it's so important. And fat actually helps you lose weight. And uh, just having a spoonful of coconut oil first thing in the morning. I sprinkle it with, with cinnamon if I feel like my kids aren't getting enough fat. But there's people who've just been having a spoonful of coconut oil in the morning. And it just, it, that alone helps them stabilize their energy, energy system. Are Especially, you talking a tablespoon or a teaspoon? Just a spoonful. Yeah, I don't, I don't measure it. I just eat it. Is that um, a soup? No, it's just a regular spoon. <laughs> and I just dip it in and eat it. Um, and those are the mornings when I feel like I'm not going to get, like I can't sit, eat a really, really good breakfast, you know, if I just have, if I'm too quick. Like this morning, for example, I, I made myself a smoothie with the, with the protein. I'm not a big fan of, of protein, but I do eat it when I'm in a rush. So I had protein with a bunch of kale and spinach and stuff like that, but uh, a shake with coconut milk. But I just needed some more fat. Um, so I had a spoonful or so of that, of that fat in there. It just helps your energy sort of stay that way all day um, versus the carbs. The next question I want to, I want to, uh, does everybody know what that is? You guys know what that is. Yeah, and what are those two, two things? Anyone know? The red one muscle? Yep, the red one's muscle and the, and the uh, yellow one is fat. And they're both a pound, right? So um, when, when we do this course, it's not so much about weight loss, right, um, the scale, right? So if people comment, I lost five pounds, I lost two pounds, you know, that's a, a lot of it can be water. It's more about your body composition. Um, I weigh a lot, like I'm heavy, that's why I can't do pull-ups, sure. <laughs> um, so uh, and people are always like, surprised at how much I weigh, I weigh a lot. Um, muscle, weighs, muscle weighs a lot. Um, some people on this have, have not lost weight, but they've lost inches. Um, they're, they're, they, you know, their tummies have gone, but they've actually put weight on because over, the, over the course of time. And, uh, over eight weeks, you're not, that's not going to happen. But over the course of three months, six months, um, because we want to put muscle on and lose, and, lose, and lose body fat. And muscle takes up far less space than body fat. It's just something I, I, I'm sure most people know, but it's, it's important to keep that in mind, that this isn't necessarily about weight loss, it's more about body composition, strength, putting on muscle and energy and how you're feeling and how you're looking and how healthy is your skin and your hair and how are your moods and, you know, if, if there's inflammation in your system. Um, Excuse me. Can you do this without um, um, exercising? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, I think you can reach a really... <laughs> I think you can. I think you can reach a really, really high level of health. Um, and my husband would shoot me for this because he's a big exercise and you guys, I think you can, and, and I'm not saying not exercising, not exercising, I mean, that doesn't mean not moving, right? Mm -hmm. Human body was designed to move. You can do a ton just with diet alone, a ton. Because um, exercise, and exercise in the wrong way can cause inflammation, can make you hungry, can deplete all your stores. Like, some people, they exercise too soon, too much. Like that's one of the biggest problems with people who exercise. They're, they're doing too much, um, too much exercise, and they're not working on the other things like diet and sleep and things, and things like that. Now, you're only going to get to a certain level if you don't exercise. You're not going to put muscle on if you don't exercise. 
um, and you're not going to work your cardiovascular system. I mean, exercise is vital. If you don't exercise, you're not going to be totally healthy. But you can do a lot. As we said in the beginning, 80% of your ability to lose body fat is, is your body to change your body composition. That's actually diet um, because you start to burn, if you can teach your body to burn fat. Um, I'm not saying not to exercise. I'm just saying that diet is really, really plays a big role. If your diet's off, and you're just fueling yourself with the wrong things, and you're exercising, you're, actually, you're just not going to get the benefits from the exercise. Other than, you know, the basic benefits like cardiovascular health and that sort of stuff. There's a lot more benefits to exercise. So let's talk about what we can do to control our insulin, because that is the key here. We, get, we need to get off the sugar, the sugar insulin train, right? That up and down, up and down, that you sort of missed this week, right? The biggest key to doing that if you, if you don't want to feel it during the day, is when you get up in the morning, within a half an hour to an hour of waking up, have some protein and some fat, if you can, but have some protein and fat. If you want to have an easy source of fat, an avocado. Um, but have some protein within a half an hour of waking up. Um, eggs, a protein shake, um, you know, any kind of leftover meat from the night before, if you can. It's really hard for a lot of people to do, but it's one of the most important things as far as energy throughout the day. Eat only real food that has a moderate natural effect on the insulin load. So apparently, um, for example, uh, diabetics, they can eat an orange, but they can't eat orange juice. Orange juice just, you know, causes major problems. But an orange, because of the fiber in the orange, it, it controls the glycemic effect of the food. So a whole fruit versus the juice is an entirely different species. If you eat food in its natural state, um, chances are it probably doesn't have a huge, huge detrimental glycemic effect. So if we think about most of the foods that are come from nature in their natural state that we would eat, like bread isn't in its natural state. Its natural state is the wheat that's waving around in the, you know. A carrot's in its natural state. Even with the dirt on it's probably better. Um, a cucumber is in its natural state. A sweet potato is really high in carbohydrates, but it's in its natural state, and it's got lots of fiber in it, so it doesn't have a huge glycemic effect, although more so than a steak. Does that make sense? I guess a steak really is in its natural state, is it? Where do you get your fiber in all of this? Oh my gosh, where do you get your fiber? Uh, there's tons of fiber in vegetables, right? It's, right? Tons. Like, that's what vegetables are, primarily fiber. Fruit, tons of fiber. Tons and tons of fiber. There should be no issues as far as fiber um, in, in this type of thing. This is one of the problems with Atkins, is that there, was no, there weren't a lot of any vegetables. It was so low carb, there was no vegetables. Kale, um, you know, kale, spinach, and then the vegetables are just going to start going crazy right now. So there's, there's a ton of fiber um, in, in, uh, in the diet. Exercise frequently at a low intensity. We'll talk about that next week. Stress your muscular system uh, a few times a week with high intensity, right? Remember that all the, uh, the low intensity exercise sort of keeps you in that it doesn't push you into the need for sugar as fuel. If you keep at a low intensity kind of all day moving, you can use fat as a fuel. You can train your body to use fat as a fuel all day long. You, should just, you can just keep going. You, you, you move up into that moderate you know, level all day long, running, stress, this sort of thing, three hour runs, you start to need, you start to deplete your glycogen stores and you start to need some carbohydrates. And, um, Stressing your muscular system, right? Draining that glycogen store in the, in the, will also increase your insulin sensitivity. So that will help. Occasional maximal out, all out effort. So Michelle will talk about all that next week. Ditch the grains. So this is a big part of this. And so I want to talk to you about grains tonight. So first of all, after talking about this, the insulin effect of grains. All grains um, have a huge um, insulinogenic effect, right? They will all, as soon as you eat them, they turn to sugars. Every single one of them. There isn't a grain. All, they all turn to sugar and they all um, bump your insulin up. So that's why when people ditch the grains, they start to feel a little bit better. Their mind, they get out of that sort of mind fog. Their energy, their energy comes up when they stop eating grains. And does everyone understand that gluten is just a protein that's in a certain type of grain, right? So. A patient of mine this week, which is great, she and her daughter, um, they're having a lot of health issues and they've gone gluten free. Great. It's a really, really good first step. Well, they went to the grocery store and they bought every gluten free product on the shelf and, it, and like, it's disgusting. Like They're eating cheese pops and, other, and, and corn pops and pop tarts and ding dongs and like, yeah, they're gluten free. 
So, but they're not healthy, right? They still have so much crap in them and the insulin effect and probably a gut effect and that sort of thing. Going gluten-free is, 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 is a good step in the right direction. It's the grains that are a lot of problems. So let's talk about that. So the ins insulin, um, insulin, the effect it has on insulin. The inflammatory effect of grains is, is, is huge, partially because of the insulin. So people will say, like Lisa was talking, they, you know, um, problems with joint pain, back pain, foot pain, they're just achy all the time. When they start to decrease the amount of sugar in their system, their pain starts to disappear and their, infl their level of inflammation starts to, starts to come down. And it's basically because of the hormonal effect of these foods. The sugar is decreasing, the, the insulin is coming down, and the inflammatory effect of the sugars and the insulin, which is, which is basically the same thing, is starting to come down. So, so they really, really do all cause inflammation. So many diseases, um, autoimmune diseases, and Dr. Murphy will be doing a talk soon on leaky gut, on gut health, and she'll talk about the, the link between a lot of grains and um, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, um, not necessarily osteoarthritis, but inflammation in general. So when I have patients who are really, really inflamed, and I say get off sugar, I should actually say get off anything that turns into sugar really, right, because it's just, it causes so much inflammation in our system. People don't know about this one, and this is really imperative, especially with children, is the mineral and vitamin deficiencies that grains cause. Grains, and particularly whole grains, bind to, um, they have a sort of a, they have a covering basically called the phytic acid, and it binds to um, certain minerals in our system. So they grab iron, they grab um, calcium, magnesium, and they bind and they leach it out of our system. So we eat these whole grains because we think they're so good for us, but they're actually causing mineral deficiencies in our in our system. They have this; they bind it and take it out of our take it take it out of our body. So we do not want to eat them because they have an anti-nutrient effect on our on our whole system. People didn't know that. So because they're so they're so hard to digest and they have this they, they bind to particularly iron. A lot of kids are iron deficient. And um, it's funny, there's a very there's a big group of children who are having a lot of problems because and, and it's it's interesting. Their parents are, are really, really healthy. So they eat whole grain this and whole grain everything. They don't eat any processed foods, so they're not getting like the pop tarts and the and the iron fortified frosted flakes. So they're not getting any iron fortification in their foods. They're eating a ton of whole grains, and they're really iron deficient because they're not getting any iron sources from anything. And those all those whole grains are binding with them. If you have to eat rice. White rice, although it's got a huge glycemic index, uh, uh, insulin effect, white rice is actually easier on, on your digestive system than, um, than whole grain rice. They don't digest well. The, the outer surface of the, uh, of the grain um, is a huge, huge gut irritant, which Dr. Murphy is going to, going, to, uh, going to talk about. We don't digest them very well. In nature, they're not digested. They used to um, ferment grains. And, and soak them for days, and then they would be they would be more digestible. So when you not sake? pardon? Is that not sake? I don't know what sake is. Is that fermented fermented rice or something like that? That's yeah, 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 yeah. yeah um, no, but I, when I'm talking about fermented or sprouting, I should say more or less. So you would you would take these and they would sprout them and soak them in water, and basically that takes out the outer laying of phytic acid away from it, so that the phytates basically. Um, so it takes the phytates away, and then they're more they're easily digested. So like that pre pre digested rice is the least thing on your you know least assault on your body, but it has no nutrient value. Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about replacing nutrient dense foods. So back in the day when the hunter and gatherers were there, they would go out and maybe they'd work all day. They'd paddle and they'd work, and they'd come home with you know their their canoe full of a few handfuls of wild rice or some grains, and then they would soak them and eat them. We fill our entire plate up with noodles and then have a, you know, maybe a bit of meat sauce on top of it or tomato sauce. And or we have these big, huge sandwiches with no, with a, you know, piece of lettuce and so they, we're, we're, and then, or you have a stir fry with this huge amount of rice and a little bit of vegetable on top. The risk of eating grains is that it's supplant, it's, it's, it's replacing all the nutrient dense food. There's a fantastic video out there. Uh, it's, and, and uh, Catherine will post it on Facebook this week in our Facebook group, 
It's by Dr. Wallace, by Dr. Terry Wallace, and um, she's an MS, based, she's recovered from MS based on her diet. And we don't have, and her message is basically we don't have room in our diet for foods that one, not only take nutrients away, but have no nutrients in them. So everyone always says, oh, but like, you know, it's so good for you. But is it? Like, is it really? Is rice really good for you? What's in it? There's nothing in rice that can compare to any vegetable out there, not one. You cannot, like, you cannot compare any vegetable to any grain and get a better nutrient complex from vegetables or meat, for example, to, to the grains that are out there. There's not a single grain out there that has anything in it. Like, what, a, what the heck is a spaghetti noodle? Like, why are we eating this stuff? It's completely empty, and whole wheat's even worse. Like, there's just, it, it has an anti, which we didn't know. So when you think about any of the grains you're eating, like bread, like, like really, what's in bread? So you can go and buy that Dempster's Canadiana bread that's got, and, you, and if you just look at the yellow, the, the white thing on there, it says it's got like iron and all these niacin and, and thiamine and all this sort of stuff, but those have all been added to it. Like those aren't naturally occurring, they've been added to it, and they're not, and if they are naturally occurring, they're actually not that bioavailable. They may be in the whole grain, but they're actually not, we can't digest it anyway, so it's not that bioavailable. And those Dempster's Canadian bread, one of the first ingredients is high fructose corn syrup. If you see an ingredient that says glucose fructose, that's high fructose corn syrup, and it's an assault not only on your, on your, on your um, insulin, but it goes right to your liver and causes tons of, tons of problems. Dr. Lustig will talk about the effect of high fructose corn syrup. So, we think about these grains, like a patient I was today was saying, like, oh, I, I, you know, I, my kids, they had cornflakes for breakfast. And I was just like, oh, man, like, I, I haven't even thought of that. Like, I can't imagine sending my kids to school with cornflakes. There's nothing in cornflakes, nothing, other than calories, right? And we'll fill them up and they'll be hungry. And maybe the milk on top has a little bit, you know, it's a little bit better for them if they can even digest the milk that they're eating and through the pasteurization process. If it's made in a factory, it's not gonna be good for you. And really those, those foods have nothing in them. So if we start looking at these foods that we thought were healthy, a bagel, right? People eat bagels all the time. There is nothing in a bagel um, other than insulin. <laughs> it's gonna, insulin isn't in the bagel. It's gonna jack your insulin. It's going to cause inflammation in your gut um, which some people feel, some people don't. Um, it's, it can cause inflammation through your whole, throughout your whole system. It's going to potentially bind with other vital minerals in your system. And you're eating something where you could be eating something of true value to your body. Right? So those are four pretty good reasons to completely ditch, ditch grains. Um, when we give our kids grains, like when we feed them rice or something, I, it's just, I know in my head it's just filler. It's because they're hungry. And they just, it's just, it's just filler. But really, there's, there, we don't have a lot of time for filler. They're growing so much. We need to be constantly filling ourselves with, with uh, high nutrient dense foods. So ditch the grains, ditch the sugar, right? We need to, so um, a lot of people, we did this once during um, Halloween and everybody's like, oh, I can still have sugar. I can still eat those. Those are full of high fructose corn syrup, right? It's made from corn. So this isn't part of the diet. Uh, because it's made out of corn, and corn is a grain. Corn's a really, like, corn is everywhere, right? Like, it's everywhere. Our gas is made out of it, and our food is made out of it. So much of our food has high fructose corn syrup in it. And what do they give cows and animals to fatten them up before they go to slaughter? Grain, right? They feed them grain all the time. They just, it fattens them up. So we eat grain, we get fat. It's just, it's just the way it goes. Um, and, and this the sugar, you just we just have to stop. It's, it's, it's toxic for us. It causes a ton of inflammation. It really, really affects our, affects our energy level. And there's just no, there's nothing in that that's any good. Yeah, um, but it's so tasty. It's so tasty. <laughs> so there's, and there's, there's room for so tasty, right? Like, I mean, 80-20, right? So, so this Easter, our kids are going to have some of that sort of stuff. Um, I'm at the point now where I, ugh, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't want to eat it. Um, and sometimes I'll try it and to reaffirm that I don't like to eat it. But um, occasionally, it's not a big deal. But try, if you can go for 30 days without it, and then see how you feel when you add it in. I think that's the biggest thing, is that you've got to come off of it in order to know how badly you felt when you were on it. Because you just won't recognize it. You'll just, you'll just keep eating it and eating it.
It's a hugely addictive. Sugar is hugely, hugely addictive because it, it makes us feel good. And then, and then, you know, and then it's just, you end up like that all day long. Um, exercise, increase insulin, insulin sensitivity so we can manage our insulin. So this is why some of these like um, big endurance athletes and all these athletes can eat more carbohydrate food or higher glycemic food and still look great is because their, their insulin sensitivity is, is really, really high and it just gets stored in their system. We, most, most people don't have, don't have that and Michelle will talk about that. And that's the end of that. So let's, uh, let's have some questions if anybody has any questions about the food.